The Talk with Tariro is the name of the program. Hello and welcome. Uh, we are continuing with our discussion that we had uh, last week where we're looking at uh, the issues of uh, gender-based violence. Uh, a lot was unpacked. And this week we would want to know, yes, we had, if you go to Musasa, you get all the uh, counseling, you get uh, shelter, you get all sorts. But there are some who might have misgivings. We are saying when it comes to safeguarding me as a person who has gone to them for shelter, uh, to be sheltered under the Musasa tree, how are they safeguarding me holistically? On the program, we are joined by uh, Sharon Matinguina, who is uh, a program officer with uh, Musasa. Um, Sharon, I would want you to unpack for us when we are talking about uh, safeguarding and protecting survivors. What exactly do you do? as an institution. Thank you, Tariro, for having me on the show. So as Msasa Project, we are committed to beneficiary safeguarding. Mm. When we talk about beneficiary safeguarding, we are talking about ensuring that we do no harm to beneficiaries that come to Msasa with trust that we are able to assist them with their various problems. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that? Okay, so we are committed to um, beneficiary safeguarding and we assume the duty of care. Mm -hmm. The moment a client steps into our shelters, our one-stop centers, or even during community dialogues, mm -hmm. we have a commitment charter that all uh, staff members sign in commitment that as a service deliverer, we make sure that we protect beneficiaries from further harm. Mm -hmm. We identify ourselves as potential perpetrators of violence because anyone is a potential perpetrator of violence. Mm -hmm. So when a client comes to Musasa, we explain to them that as Musasa, we are supposed to protect you from further harm. Yes. So you should also identify me as someone who can also perpetrate violence to you. Mm -hmm. okay. So we do not take advantage of the vulnerability of survivors that come to Musasa, mm -hmm. but we ensure that they are able to know and assert their rights it's where we are giving them a service. Mm -hmm. So be it our call center, be it our shelters, be it our one-stop centers, or even community engagements, we assure them that Musasa is there to protect them and any violation should be immediately reported mm -hmm. and investigations take off right after a report has been filed. Mm -hmm. So we encourage survivors to continue coming to Musasa knowing that as service providers, we ensure their security, their safety, and their protection. Mm -hmm. In terms of security, what do you do to make sure that I am safe as an individual? Let's say I've come to your to your center and uh, somehow somebody gets to know that, uh, um, okay, my wife is uh, at um, this center and then I can actually um, go there and forcibly get them or even beat them some more. How do you? make sure that I'm, I'm protected through that uh, safeguarding, the security aspect of it. Okay, so as we said, um, as Musasa, protection is one of the critical components of service delivery. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that our one-stop centers and our shelters, urban shelters particularly, are manned by our security personnel and security companies. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we've also put CCTV just so that we strengthen security. But when it comes to our rural settings where we have rural shelters, we've also ensured that besides the security companies that we employ, mm -hmm. the traditional leaders and community leaders that surround the shelters are the first port of call in terms of response. So for example, example, in Bikita, one of the headmen makes sure that immediately when we call them, mm. they send their bodyguards to come and offer protection services to the shelters. So when mm. it comes to rural shelters, we've encouraged community ownership so that whether Msasa still runs the shelter or not, they still take it as their own uh, production. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to involve the communities uh, when it comes to community shelters. But with urban shelters, uh, given the skills that robbers mm. and yes. attackers in urban mm. areas also have, have, we've made sure that we have a combination of rapid response, CCTV, and mm -hmm. security personnel that man our centers 24-7. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that um, um, when I am a survivor of uh, gender-based violence, my mm. self-esteem has gone low, and sometimes issues of, um, there's some form of stigma that is attached by uh, to just being somebody who is uh, abused on a regular basis. Confidentiality. How do you ensure that uh, there is that confidentiality when I've walked into, into your center? That even, I don't want people to know that I've gone to, to you, I've come to you, 
I've gone to your to your shelter. That's where I'm uh, I'm being housed. That's where I'm being um, um, assisted. I don't want. How do you make sure that uh, that happens? Okay, as an organization, one of our values is confidentiality. And as part of the principles of counseling, confidentiality is also very important. So besides telling our clients that we are committed to beneficiary safeguarding, we also assure them that we are committed to confidentiality so that they know that when they are sharing their stories, mm -hmm. Msasa is committed to making sure that no one else, else will hear their stories. But mm -hmm. we also emphasize that there is what we call shared confidentiality. Mm -hmm. When in instances we need then to rope in other stakeholders like the police, the Minister of Health, mm -hmm. we explain to a client that in these instances we'll make sure that we share your story but based on what you want us to share mm -hmm. so that we don't violate their confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And when it's violated, what happens? When it's violated, mm -hmm. the client has the right to report to our safeguarding committee because they are also responsible for ensuring that all principles of beneficiary safeguarding are implemented and put in force. Mm -hmm. And in terms of safeguarding, as within that shelter, because definitely it won't just be me, there are others who have also come in just to make sure that uh, there is um, uh, a good coexisting relationship amongst ourselves as, as, as survivors who are within the center. How do you make sure that uh, that, uh, that is also practiced by survivors who are within the center? Okay, I think as you know that when a group of women come together, usually chances of squabbles are mm -hmm. very high. Yes. So we make sure that our shelter administrator who is also employed as a counsellor is readily available at the shelter all the time. In their absence, we make sure there is a relief matron who takes over the reign and makes sure that all our clients receive immediate support. Mm -hmm. If there is an immediate report about a, counsel, about a client violating another client, then our shelter administrator, our relief matron and our security Security mm -hmm. can intervene so that clients can also live in peace. Remember, they are running away from violence. So we don't want the shelter or the one-stop center or the mm -hmm. call center to be another hub of violence for survivors. Mm -hmm. Safeguarding and protection of survivors. That's our focus uh, for discussion on the talk this week. Join us after the break. Welcome back. Our discussion continues where we are looking at uh, issues of uh, safeguarding and protection of survivors of gender-based violence. And um, I, I am on the program with uh, Sharon Matinguina from Sasa Project. We are continuing with our discussion. Um, when we're looking at uh, these shelters that we are talking about, uh, Sharon, people would want to know, um, I'm in Zarabani, I'm in Uzumba Maramba Pungwe, I'm in Gutu. Where is this shelter? Um, are you in urban areas only or when I'm in my village in Gutu there, I can actu actually access your services? Where exactly are your shelters? Okay, thank you, Tariro. We have a total of 12 shelters in the country and setting up um, an additional three shelters. So by end of year, we'll be having 15. Mm -hmm. So among our shelters, we have three urban shelters in Arare, Gweru, and Vulawayo. Those are the urban shelters, meaning the rest of the shelters are set up within our community mm -hmm. areas, rural areas. Yes, yes uh, we have shelter, a shelter in Gutu, in Chikomba, in Mazowe, in Mwenezi, in Wubi, we are setting up in Mzingwane, and we are also setting up in Nemama and mm -hmm. Mutari. Yes. So do we get to know that's a Msasa uh, shelter? Because I would <laughs> maybe want to then <laughs> come to you. And, 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 and I'm just assuming if it's known that, yes, that's the shelter. Um, if I can't find my wife, then I'll know that's where she is after beating her. Yes, okay. So when it comes to urban shelters, the location is a secret. The reason why it's a secret is because we want to ensure strict security given the dynamics in urban settings. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to community shelters, the idea of us uh, setting up community shelters was to ask communities to come up with an initiative mm -hmm. to safeguard and protect survivors of violence. So it was never a secret from the time we we're setting mm -hmm. up. We've involved the community leaders, the traditional leadership, the religious leaders, and community members. So they all know that is a Msasa shelter. But everyone makes efforts and goes out of their way to make sure that it's secure and protected. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to running a community shelter, it is community owned. Wow. 
And traditional leaders are very active in ensuring security, in ensuring that even some supplies are given to the shelter mm -hmm. based on it being owned by the community. So that's the difference between a community shelter mm -hmm. and an urban shelter. Mm -hmm. yes. What I would want, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in the, the, the community shelters because I'm seeing there's that ownership. So the community would be knowing that man is abusing the wife, so the wife is actually going to that center. What happens there? Okay, most of the clients that come to community shelters are either referred by other GBV service providers okay. or by religious leaders mm -hmm. and traditional leaders. But of course, we do get working clients that know about the shelter mm -hmm. and about the program. Because as I said before, before we set up a shelter, we ensure that the communities know that this is what we want and they also accept and appreciate mm -hmm. it as an in initiative. Mm -hmm. So we do have clients that come on their own and also have those that are referred. Mm -hmm. And they still come to the shelter and get all the services and protection mm -hmm. and who is manning these centers is it community community members do you have your staff there but also working with uh, community members yeah i'm looking at the issue that we are often talking about here in zimbabwe where we are saying within that particular community we also need to empower them employment creation within that community mm -hmm. what happens Okay, when it comes to our community shelter, it is manned by a shelter administrator who is uh, a counsellor or a psychologist by profession. Uh -huh. Then we also the, we have the relief shelter administrator who comes in the absence of the shelter administrator, whom we take directly from the community, mm -hmm. either recommended by community leaders or also, also some whom we've worked with during, during our community engagements. Mm -hmm. Then our security personnel are also recommended by the community members, mm -hmm. which, makes it, um, which makes it very easy for communities to also understand understand the shelter mm. concept in mm. case after 10 years we then say uh, chief so and so we are now handing over the mm. community mm. to you or we are handing over to the church because some of our shelters are set up within church communities mm. we have the Methodist church we have the Zion Christian church mm. who are also supporting us with this initiative so with these shelters within the rural areas um, their beds everything people would come there what did they spend their day doing within that that particular sense i want to start off with the, the the rural communities okay with our rural communities even with our urban communities we've made sure that we offer a comprehensive package of care meaning that besides psychosocial support mm -hmm. which is very important and we recognize it a survivor will also need a skill that will give them economic independence mm -hmm. upon discharge from the shelter we want them to start an income generating project so that they can sustain themselves and their children so we have a livelihood project that vary from area to area. It mm. is based on the context of that area. So in Gutu, for example, at Sote, we have a, a goat rearing project, which is uh, running very well, a poultry project in the market gardening. It is also informed by market demands in that area. Mm. But clients are also leaning on how to do goat rearing, poultry rearing, mm. market gardening, so that upon discharge, they're able to pursue these projects and generate income. Mm -hmm. yes. One thing that I want to... To, to, to ask, you know, when you're talking about um, this income generating projects, it's almost like we are saying often people who are abused are those with um, little to no resources. Mm -hmm. And you also find that uh, people from the up market areas often suffer in silence mm -hmm. because for me to be seen going to a, to a shelter, what are your demographics in terms of uh, who is within your, your, your centers, the representation of women, where are they coming from, uh, the age groups, all that? Okay, when it comes to our urban shelters, we have a combination of both. But in rural areas, it's predominantly the most vulnerable groups mm -hmm. in communities. Mm -hmm. But as we, as you know that uh, we had a plea from some professional women, I yes. remember last year mm -hmm. in 2019, saying that most of the programs that are um, being rolled out by women's rights organizations yes. are targeting vulnerable mm -hmm. rural women, mm -hmm. meaning that you are leaving professional women whom are afraid of reporting because in some instances mm. they say we have a lot to lose. Exactly. So we've rolled out a program for professional women using our social media engagements mm -hmm. because we know it's ready love available for them so that they're also able to report violence through our text it platform, our WhatsApp platform, our call center and our social media handles. Mm -hmm. So our program is all inclusive. It looks at the elite women. It looks at are any they other women. to the shelters? I want to know in terms of safeguarding them, <laughs> protecting them at these shelters. Are they coming? I mean, Definitely centers. at the Arare mm. shelter, we have a lot of elite women who are also accessing the shelter services. Mm -hmm. But for rural shelters, I would not lie, it's predominantly vulnerable women. Mm -hmm. We have um, little in, in, term, in terms of finances. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Well, join us after the break as we continue with our discussion looking at safeguarding and protection of gender-based violence survivors. Welcome back. We are continuing with our discussion. Before we went uh, for the break, I was uh, asking Sharon about um, whether affluent women do go to these centers because oftentimes um, uh, women who do go to work, who are well up, often struggle to find places where they can get assistance and they are abused. You often hear Munachins, yeah, Rover, but Arkurowa, mm -hmm. you know, they experience all sorts. So, so, all sorts. So, she has uh, enlightened us that yes, we can actually go to them. But what I also want to then find out, uh, Sharon, is um, you've talked about what they spent the whole day doing. Mm -hmm. I'm a working woman, I'm expected to be at work. So, if I'm within your shelter, what happens to me being um, employed, needing to go to work? Okay, thank you, Tariro. Uh, as a survivor, you still have your rights and you are allowed to continue going to work as long as you make a decision that you are safe. Because one of the reasons you came to the shelter is so that you are away from the perpetrator. Yeah. So if we work together with the victim-friendly unit and identify that this survivor is able to continue going to work, maybe the perpetrator is awaiting bail or there are different mm. circumstances, mm. you can still continue going to work. For example, one of our shelters uh, is demarcated in two. We have the half Halfway home and the main shelter. The halfway home is dedicated for working women or students who want to continue going to school while mm -hmm. pursuing the legal mm -hmm. um, recourse. So yeah. yes, it's possible to continue with your studies or to continue with work while you are in one of our shelters. Mm -hmm. And and linked to that, that's where we are saying my husband would be knowing. Okay, that's a workplace. She's not at home. Mm -hmm. Then they can actually trail me and see where I am staying. You have said your your, your shelters are confidential. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people shouldn't know where they are because you want to safeguard um, uh, the, the survivors who are there. Mm -hmm. What then? How do you then ensure when I'm going to work and then coming back to the shelter? Yes, you've said you work with the vi victim. From there are different dynamics that that yes. bring in challenges there mm -hmm. once um, violence is happening to to a woman and her needing to continue with her professional or educational life. Mm -hmm. What happens? Okay, as I said, Tariro, it's quite relative. It depends on the nature of the case and where the perpetrator is at at the moment. So this perpetrator is at home? If the perpetrator mm. is at home, then we engage probably the client to inform their employer that for the next two weeks mm -hmm. or 14 days, I'm asking for permission not to check out at work okay. for reasons of my security. Mm -hmm. So we have that option as well. But for those whom we deem and together with our other partners that whom, we, whom would have referred them, they can continue going to work. Mm -hmm. But if it's not possible based on security reasons, then you will not be able to continue going to work. But it is your decision. Mm -hmm. As I said before, that we don't make decisions decisions for our clients yeah. yes we allow them to take the initiative but also just uh, guide them in terms of their security and protection mm -hmm. then um, take it I'm, I'm a married woman I've been abused I've got three children and um, I'm leaving home with my katundu heading to Msasa with my my children one I'm breastfeeding the other one is seven the other one is five and I'm coming to you does your shelter accommodate me oh, with yes. my children and how do you protect and safeguard these minors? Oh yes, Tariro, we have a provision for that. We have a dedicated budget for all our shelters for accompanying children, which we call the children's course budget. It mm -hmm. is upon the realization that the only way a woman can be at peace while re receiving support is when they have their children around. Mm -hmm. So we have facilities for accompanying children. We make sure that they continue going to school if it is possible based on the nature of the case. Mm -hmm. We also make sure that they have access to learning materials, playing materials, and we also identify them as potential potential uh, survivors of violence because mm. they would have suffered violence either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So they also get counseling services. They also get uh, an opportunity to continue with their studies, to play, to learn and to relax mm -hmm. as children. Mm -hmm. um, on the children, in terms of uh, the safeguarding as well, when they have gone to school, remember the stigma that I talked about mm -hmm. earlier on, how do you also, when they are within the center, through the counseling that you have, you have said you, you would offer them, how do you make sure this child um, continues being a child? 
Okay, so if you look at most of our shelters, they are located either within a school setup or very mm. close to a primary school setup. So one of our critical stakeholders within the GBV network in that area would be the school leadership meaning that we ensure that the school leadership understands more about GBV, mm -hmm. understands more about what children go through when their parents are being abused. So when the, ch the child is accepted at school, they continue to get extra care and also the teachers and the leadership of that school makes efforts to make sure that uh, she's not, he or she is not further traumatized mm -hmm. and stigmatized based on what their parent would have gone through. Mm -hmm. What are your success stories? Oh, we have so many mm. success stories, mm. but uh, maybe just to say Msasa is the first organization to set up a community-based shelter. Mm. It is an initiative that we started in 2013, mm. and the Boera Shelter being the first community-based shelter that we set in the country. And it has been a model for most of the community shelters that other partners mm. are also setting up. Mm -hmm. So that is one of our key achievements as an organization in terms of direct service provision. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of saying um, we have women who are being abused, we successfully maybe um, counseled them. Now they are living happily. Some even have gone back. These perpetrators have now um, reformed. Do you have such kind of success stories? Yes, Tari. We document what we call most significant stories of change, mm -hmm. where we document successes that have come about through the initiatives that we offer, be it in our one-stop centers, the shelters, or the call center. We have had um, uh, survivors who have shared their testimonies on where they are after receiving a service from SASA. So we have one of our clients who is now um, studying at the university who received a shelter through, um, through Musasa and we made sure that she's reintegrated back into the school system and also accepted back into the family after mm. reporting a case of rape. Mm -hmm. What is your parting shot to Zimbabweans when we are looking at issues of uh, safeguarding and protecting um, survivors of uh, gender-based violence? Okay, I'm just urging Zimbabweans to fight gender-based violence to ensure the protection of women and girls and all citizens, not just women and girls, mm -hmm. so that it is a safe space and a safe country for all citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, we heard it from uh, Sharon. We all have a role to ensure that um, we make our country, our communities safe for everyone. Until we meet again next week, it's goodbye for now.